Without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to our first speaker, Alex Purves, who made it against all odds from UCLA, and she will be presenting a paper entitled Body Simile. Thank you. Thank you so much to Chiara and Adrian for organizing such an exciting and interesting um, topic for us to talk around these next few days. I apologize for getting things off to a couple of minutes slow start, um, but I'm glad to be here. Um, OK, so I'll get going. I think there's a handout. Could anybody let me know if they need help getting hold of the handout? Because I could share it, but if not, I'll just go ahead. I'm I'm popping that into the chat oh, right now. So perfect. Uh, yeah. OK, thank you. OK, bodies and similes occupy two different conceptual worlds, one corporeal, the other rhetorical. Yet the body in Homer could not exist without the simile, which follows it far and wide as its abstract adjacent double. At the same time, the simile is not a shadow. It runs according to its own agencies, its own energies, and its own transformative potential. The double colon of my title, therefore, is an attempt to connect the space between the physical edge of the body and the formal demarcation of the simile in Homeric poetry. I wanted to leave that space open so that the double colon can stand as an indicator of similarity, meaning like or is to, but also so that it can simply stand as a space, as the passage demarcating what the body crosses in moving from one side of the equation to the other. This four dotted symbol appeals to me because it is porous and multidirectional. As a punctuation mark that extends vertically and horizontally through space, it, marks, it makes concrete the mediated passage of bodies on their way to becoming similes. For the purposes of this paper, the space between those four dots will be more important to me than the space within the body. In other words, my aim here is to write a paper that deals not so much with the intensity and affect that comes from the M of embodiment, but rather with the intensity and affect that comes from thinking about the body in terms of diffusion and dissolution, of the body being porous with permeable edges or surfaces, to the extent that it can slide easily into other bodies, other places, and other rhetorical frames. Is the hearing okay? I just read the chat. Are we okay? I, th I think we're getting it sorted out. <laughs> Don't okay, worry about I'm sorry. It. <laughs> I, may, I, just, I just looked up and saw the chat. I see that slide at work, especially in the Homeric simile, where a body is compared to something else and crosses over. In doing so, it inhabits the simile for a short period of time and then steps back. Inspired by both Elena Ferrante's concept of the body's dissolving margins and Tim Ingold's weather world, handout one, I would like to think of the body not as an object that has closed in on itself and turned its back on the world, but rather as a process of comings and goings, caught up in the fluxes of a medium that we might call, as shorthand, the weather. I find the weather, or Ingold's weather world, a useful gener general category, not only because it, it insists on permeability and transibility as its dominant motifs, but also because it works so well with affect, which could be characterized in a sense as one's own personal weather system. Homeric epic is a relentlessly open space, and as the similes move through that space, they weather the poems, bringing in storms, rain and wind, as they also emerge out of the weather that is created by other forms of movement. In the Iliad, for example, it is as if the similes are generated by the jostling or static of the fighting men. An interference emerging from characters who, in their actions or emotions, create their own weather. It has been well noted in the scholarship that we find a good amount of weather similes in the Iliad in particularly charged or intense moments. And I wonder if we could see those similes as a kind of hovering over of affect, a materialization of the affect generated by the scene below. With these opening statements in mind, let me now narrow down my argument somewhat 
I would like in this paper to focus on the connection between similes and water, taking the shipwrecked Odysseus in Odyssey 5 as my focus. Water matters to me because it combines both of the frames I have so far discussed. First, it is part of Homer's weather world, as is evidenced by the constant recourse in both epics to the sea and to waves. Second, water is a, is a reflective as well as an opaque medium, offering on its surface um, a mirror of like for like, and below its surface, a space of submersion, erosion, and disappearance. Water is therefore particularly useful for thinking about the ways in which similes both reflect and drift away from their object of comparison. Certain types of colors, shapes, and materials tend to collect underwater, and I will argue that similes tend to rise to its surface. Water, moreover, is especially compatible with Ingold's weather world because it seeps into bodies and language. It makes things porous and loosens the categories between them. But it also transforms objects, encrusting them beyond recognition, saturating or swelling them, and creating wakes in which subsequent bodies might follow, whether voluntarily or not. It is highly mimetic and is particularly associated, as I'll explore in the final part of my paper, with lamentation and grief. Finally, because the sea is always mobile, it is resistant to monumentality and inscription, making it particularly appropriate to oral poetry and the free floating nature of the simile. In what follows, I will pay careful attention to waves, which act as vehicles for the body, both within and without the structure of the simile. The wave can be understood as a troubling of surface, as well as a troubling of any clean binary between above and below. The wave forces repetition and forces movement on the surface in and in its insistent relay of cresting and breaking, it rides the line between materiality and form. As Stefan Helmreich has put it, waves, waves are materialist, sorry, waves are material formal entities that are both form giving and perpetually in excess of formal representation. Because waves do not stop, to be on or just under a wave is to occupy an intense connection to the now through repetition, urgency, adrenaline, or suspense. In her poetry collection, Nobody, inspired by the Odyssey's underwater world, Alice Oswald suggests that the human body in Homer has a cork-like quality, handout two. Like a wedge of polystyrene, it is always resurfacing, drawing our attention to that line that separates what is above and below the sea. When Odysseus is shipwrecked in book five of the Odyssey, we see within the dynamics of the wave, this holding of the body both above and below. Whether alive or dead, Odysseus's body must infallibly return to the surface. Initially pulled down by the weight of his clothing, he is submerged, Hupa Bruka, for a long time under the force or Horme of the great wave, returning to the top only at the last moment, Opse, as at handout three. So for over a hundred verses, Odysseus is caught on this choppy, ever fluctuating divide between above and below. Scholars such as Grace Lila Canavero have shown how Odysseus's immersion in the sea forces a redesign of his body. He adapts to his new environment through objects such as Aino's veil or by sitting astride the keel and rowing with his hands. But I want to suggest that his body also partially vanishes into the line of verse as it merges with the fluidity of the sea. This is particularly evident in the scene where Odysseus finally reaches Scaria and holds on to its rock face, handout four. As a great wave passes over him and he is cast back to sea by its backward flow, Palerothion, Odysseus is described using the perfect middle passive participle 
episumenos, rushing, at line 428. That same participle recurs again a little later in the passage at 431, but is now presumably attributed to the wave, suggesting a blending between body and water. The exchange of the participle from one category to another is indicative of the mimetic and reflective quality that applies to a water's surface, but also of the churning of categories underneath it. Perhaps we could also say that there is a form of erosion at work in the water that wears away at the edges of the human being and that also translates into the forward and backward momentum of the Homeric line of verse, which was likened to the movement of the sea by both ancient and modern critics. In verses 429 to 31, the wave each time turns or breaks at the B caesura, pulling Odysseus back and around the line. In the process of the waves mediating to and fro, he is briefly compared to an octopus at lines 432 to 35. So we can say that the mirroring or reverberative aspect of the sea agitates language into fluid overlays, into gleaming forms of repetition, or into the lateral extension of the simile, where like is set alongside like. If water offers a surface of similarity, as Oswald has suggested, then it is also a similarity that is gliding and free floating. Similes, unlike metaphors, are not stationary, but only glancingly touch the object of their comparison before drifting loose of the narrative. No matter how hard the octopus in the simile or the simile itself tries to take grip, the onward flow of the poem will always pull it back and away. So as when thickly clustered pebbles cling to the tentacle cups of an octopus as he is being dragged from his lair, so in contact with the rock, the skin from his bold hands was torn away and the great wave covered him over. As scholars have noted, this simile works at cross purposes since what the octopus takes away with it as it is pulled from its lair, the pebbles in its tentacles, is matched by what Odysseus leaves behind, his skin grazed off by the rock. Atypically, the object of Homer's comparison is not a repeated verb unless we count echo at lines 529 and 533. Odysseus holds on, ekato, to the rock as the thick-set pebbles cling prosecontai to the suckers of the octopus. But that is not exactly what the simile seems to be trying to say. And usually the repeated verb each time introduced is each time introduced by hosts. See, for example, the other similes in the second half of book five at handouts five through eight. And you really just need to skim through these very quickly in order to see how um, each time the verb is repeated exactly or a synonym of the verb is repeated within those host clauses. At handout four, though, the simile is more protean, multiplying and refracting as it moves through the passage. Perhaps it is better to point to the repeated preposition pros within the simile proper at lines 433 and 34. The pebbles are attached to the suckers as the skin is ripped off by or to the rock. Again, this is not quite right. It's not unusual, of course, for Homer to take a left turn within a simile and shuffle the terms of the comparison, but we do have a lot of turns here and spending too much time sorting them out can make you start to feel seasick. On the one hand, Homer appears to be using the simile to show both similarity and dissimilarity, prosecontai, versus apedrupthen, but on the other, there is too much similarity here. Usually a simile's vehicle takes you to a different place and to a different kind of action. This one changes the bodies, but not the context at all. The wave and the gripping and the gripping share the same force and the same meaning in both tenor and vehicle. Odysseus, by moving underwater, has already entered into a world so alien from his own that he seems to have merged with the simile itself.
Through the medium of water, then, Odysseus is given the opportunity to explore a different form of being, one that sets up habits of movement, movement that will bring him closer to the bat which hangs upside down from the olive tree in Odyssey 12, handout 9. But Odysseus's experience within the wave also gives us the opportunity as readers to think differently about surface, depth, and adjacency as methodologies for reading. I have argued in prior work that the surface reading popularized by Best and Marcus might be especially compatible with the surface of the sea, but the octopus simile invites us to read from underneath against a surface that scrapes and loses parts of itself as the wave and various bodies bash up against it. In this interpretation, the human observer does not look at a stable surface from above, nor does she plumb the depths and detect hidden meanings, meanings through symptomatic reading practices. Instead, she is caught right within the wave, at its top, but also within it, immersed in its salinity, its pressure, and its roiling. The churning of the wave brings the simile to the surface as it brings with it the octopus up from the depths. I'm trying here, inspired by Melody Jew's recent book, to imagine how we could expand our terms outwards from surface reading or deep reading into terms like volume reading, pressure reading, saturated reading, or lateral reading. What are the possibilities that emerge when we start reading from the position of being underwater or following Jews terminology when we think through seawater. But back to simile. As Stephanie Burt expresses it in the essay Like at handout 10, metaphor and simile and all the tools that say this is like that work against time and against causality. They show a resemblance at the present moment and therefore let us hold on to a now. But the like in simile reminds us that we cannot hold on after all. Each wave moves in sequent toil and all do contend. And here Bert is quoting Shakespeare sonnet 60. In narrative poetry, Homer say, in Homer say, the epic simile stops time, stops action, moves laterally rather than back through time or ahead in the story so that we can see what other sort of thing from another story, this thing in our story resembles. The liminal work of that word like is caught right on the formal surface of this line between what's visible and invisible in Homeric poetry. Without wishing to be too Deleuzean and for Deleuze and waves, see the important work of Irene Hahn, Odysseus becomes octopus under the water because his new environment, as much as the poem, dictates it for as long as he is caught in the back and forth of reaching each time to hold on. Until he sets foot on dry land, he remains in narrative limbo, helpless against that tidal drag into other forms of being. Between the octopus's body and Odysseus's is the attempt to grip, to hold onto the rock against the force of the swell, but it is that same swell that washes Odysseus back and forth across the surface of the simile, between the octopus's body and his own, or between one host and the next. At this point, it would make sense then to turn our attention away from Odysseus's transformation into an octopus, and instead consider the ways in which the formal device of the simile acts as a wave to help him get there. Is there something about the crest of the wave or the line between air and sea that brings the simile to the surface? Notice that at handout seven, in the simile about seeing land, the analogy forms at the very crest of the wave, megalu hupokumatos artes hos dote, lines 593 to 4. Similes like waves are concepts that pass us by or briefly carry us forward, only momentarily engaging with our bodies, working away at the edges of who we are, before they leave us and return to the flow. Alice Oswald has spoken of how, in Memorial, her poem of the Iliad, she translates host with the English word like, but in Nobody, she translates it with as 
to match the fluidity of her poem. In the following extract from one of her Oxford lectures, she begins by talking about the simile of Odysseus weeping in Odyssey 8 and moves on from there to discuss the difficulty of translating Homer's host into English. This is handout 11. Homer has to step quickly. He has to get from one weeping to another by means of a small crossing word, the Greek word hos. Homer's word is a rough breathing followed by omega, the undulating last letter of the alphabet followed by S as if the wind had heaped up water and then broken it into sounds. Hos, it is hard to pronounce unless you are the wind. Whenever I read it, I think of waves altering a stretch of water and then altering it again. Hos, hos, two ripples, either side of a likeness. But there are also other words for like that take different forms from their association with water. The gentle eute that materializes from the gradual breaking through of Thetis's body from sea to shore as mist, for example, at handout 12 or the heavy splash of ikele to introduce the simile of the lead weight thundering on down through the water in Iliad 24. So there are various forms of blending between body and water that I'm trying to come to grips with here through similes, through the folding over of language under the doubling of the wave, or simply through the porous nature of the body as it makes contact with water. Odysseus reaches dry land at the end of book five with his skin bloated and with water running from his nose and mouth, handout 14. His immersion in the water has both worn him down, teramai, and filled him up, anapimplemi. Both verbs are used in, in Odysseus's passage through the sea in book five in relation to his sufferings. We see in this scene of his landing how sea and suffering have combined to leave their double mark on his body. He is quite literally both saturated and drained. When Thetis emerges from the sea in book 18 to comfort Achilles at handout 15, the edges of the Nereid's bodies blur with the salt water of the sea in an analogous way. But here it's because weeping, uh, it's in the process of weeping, dacroesi, or them weeping, as they cross through the break of the wave. And this is the next passage on your handout, 15. So how can we not read this movement as both literal and figurative? As a simile's tenor and vehicle pulled through the wave together. There is no host here, no simile and indeed no metaphor, but rather two clauses in parallel, haide isan peri de regnuto, near, near simultaneity instead of near similitude. Yet we still detect something close to a simile rising to the surface of the water. The wave properly belonging to the world of the Homeric simile here works in tandem with the tear of the Nereids who pass, the tears of the Nereids who pass through it. Neither takes precedence, but at the same time, there is a moment of cognitive or poetic difficulty in that crossing from one world to another. Waves and tears would seem to cancel each other out or wash each other away. The figurative ties between weeping and the sea are strong, from Achilles and Odysseus on their respective shores to Thetis, the sea goddess, who expresses her grief down in the depths. That flow or drift between weeping and the sea that draws on erosion, a wearing away of the self and salinity is predicated on the porousness of the sea and the body's boundaries, but also the saturation of affect and the affective upheaval of grief itself. The sea too, of course, often responds to the, emo to the emotional weather around it with groans of its own. So in Iliad 24, handout 16, as Iris descends to retrieve the weeping Thetis, the sea crashes groaning around her. 
As a final example, let's turn quickly to lyric. Archilochus is worth comparing here in a difficult fragment in which the poet advises his companion Pericles to contain his lamentation at the death of their friends in shipwreck. Handout 17. Even as it preaches moderation, however, the fragment acknowledges that the pain of their grief is like the experience of drowning itself, insofar as the lungs of both sets of men have been saturated and choked in pain. Without the use of a simile indicator such as hosts, Archilochus collapses the weight of drowning into the weight of lamentation. So fine were the men whom the wave of the much resounding sea washed over, and our lungs are swollen with pain. There is a relationality here that nevertheless insists on the drowned men's difference. The we of Echomen are definitively not those men, Toyus, that the wave submerged, and yet there is a deliquescence and fluidity between the two sets of bodies that is motivated by the underwater zone. Pericles and Archilochus are imagined to share the same pain, which itself has crossed over from the bodies of the drowned men. Even as it tries to endure and push away womenly lamentation, and line 10, therefore, the poem, through a form of mimetic or sympathetic affect, leaves us with the image of two sets of lungs swollen by the sea and by grief. The lungs, which Homer never draws explicit attention to underwater, here provide the interface between the body, grief, and the sea, as they also bridge the distance between the drowned men and those who have been left behind. Dance historian Susan Foster writes, quote, the body, the body is never only what we think it is. Elusive, always on the move, the body is at best like something, but never is that something, end quote. In a book I published in 2019, I tried to argue that the body was not singular, that gestures, for example, could be understood as communal and shared. I have tried here to suggest that the similes allow for a similar multiplying or reverberation of self, that they provide opportunities for other versions of bodies and for bodies to move freely into other forms of expression or intensity. There are so many ways to configure the like that stands beside the body and the use of simile to describe it. In the course of this paper, I have tried to pull together Stephanie Burt's like with Alice Oswald's hosts, all the while trying to bear in mind that like only works because it does not denote exact equivalence, because it is not what is. Homer is resistant to using negatives in his similes, but I want to acknowledge in closing that the not is always there, that the simile does not represent a flat collapsing into sameness, but rather an opportunity to think of the body laterally as repeatedly standing beside or like to itself, aided in its passage over by whatever wave, weather or interference was able to carry it there. Thank you.